to just go ahead and take the opportunity to welcome you all to our invited speaker event. I'm really excited to introduce Rama McKay, who's going to be talking about placing global health, space, gender, and health in Maputo, Mozambique. And I was really excited to learn about some of her work uh, in anticipation of her visit. One of the things that stood out to me is that she, she really likes these two-part titles, just a number of catchy ones, <laughs> um, including for her book, Medicine in the Meantime, the work of Karen Mozambique, which I think is um, really impressive that she has that just come out. Thank uh, you. We're really excited to have her, and uh, she is joining us from the Department of History and Sociology of Science at the University of Pennsylvania. So traveled a long way to get here. <laughs> uh, and her teaching encompasses interests in humanitarianism and global health, health and healing in Africa, critical perspectives on health and development. And so I think it really interfaces with some of what we're doing here at the Urban Health Collaborative, trying to bridge to global conversations about how cities can support health and support people. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for that introduction, Gina, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, I am an anthropologist, and I'm like disciplinarily trained both to have two-part titles in which one half of the um, title doesn't express very much, and then the other half clarifies what we're doing, and also to read our talk. So I'm going to try not to read, but I, I will have some notes because, um, because I've been well-disciplined. So. Um, I'm an anthropologist. I've worked in Mozambique since um, 2005 doing ethnographic research. Um, I have mostly worked in um, two places. So I'll be talking today about field work that I've done in Mapuchu, which is the capital city here in the south. And I've also worked in a rural part of Zambezia district, um, which is the kind of central Mozambican. Um, agricultural area and so I just before I begin want to point out that Maputo is here in the south of the country and it's very close to the South African border which will be um, relevant for some of the things that I'm talking today so in both of these um, places where I've conducted fieldwork much of my work has explored the impact of global health projects and transnational NGOs or non-governmental organizations on public health in areas such as nutrition community health and the provision of ARVs or antiretroviral medications for HIV AIDS. And I've been particularly interested in how gendered actors, um, both patients and health workers, come to claim and deliver care in a context where NGOs are highly visible and well-resourced medical actors, but where transnational projects are often implemented through um, short-term and in some ways unpredictable cycles of two, four, or five years. Um, so temporalities that kind of conflict with the imagine sort of endurance and permanence of the public health system. And in the kind of larger, um, larger project that, that culminated in the book that Gina mentioned, I talk about the ways in which that imagination of a kind of um, enduring and encompassing public health system might also be a little bit um, more imaginative than real in the experience of the actors with whom I'm concerned. So the talk that I'm presenting today is an attempt to think about how transnational practices of claiming and delivering care are shaped by urban spaces and urban economies. And I do that by following a few patients and families as they move in and out of a clinic um, where I've conducted field work and also as they move through the city of Mapuche. And I'll focus particularly today on the experiences of a woman I call Gloria and her family. Um, so I first met Gloria in 2007 um, when she came to the clinic to have her young daughter who was four years old at the time uh, tested for HIV. But I want to actually begin my talk about a year later, so when I'd known her for about a year, um, one afternoon just before Christmas, when I joined her at her father's house in Mashakeni, which is a neighborhood um, just outside the kind of city center of Maputo. And this is a, um, a picture of her father's house. So I met Gloria and her family that afternoon. Um, we had a quick lunch of rice and grilled fish, and then together with her brothers, Victor and Yvonne, her friend Amelia, um, and her um, Amelia's daughter, we walked together through the neighborhood to the Avenida de Angola, where we caught a shopa or minibus, a kind of semi-privatized mode of public transport, that we took to a suburban transit hub. Um, from there, we caught another minibus to the peri-urban neighborhood of Mashava Sosimo. And the long waits and slow journey that we experienced spoke to an ongoing transportation crisis amidst rapid urban and peri-urban growth in Mapuche. Eventually, we caught a third minibus to a neighborhood called Semse, 
a so-called new or unregulated neighborhood named after a crumbling Italian cement factory that had built, been built in the 1960s. Um, so this is a picture of Semse. It's I took it with a very old cell phone, so it's not great, but it gives you a sense of what um, the neighborhood looked like at that time. So from the last stop, from the end of the kind of minibus route, we walked about half a kilometer up a soft, dusty, unpaved road like that um, and found Gloria's new house, which was a two-room house built of canes or kind of um, found uh, organic material that was tucked at the back of a large sandy plot, much like this one. At the front of the plot, there was a baraka or a small kiosk. Um, and in contrast to the kind of precarious construction materials of the house, the baraka was built out of cement blocks like these. Um, it had an open window in front. It had space inside for a stove and also um, room to store things like drinks um, and other dry goods. So cornmeal, matches, um, alcoholic beverages, cookies, cooking oil, and other staples. Next to the baraka or kiosk, there were um, overturned beer crates that were ready to offer seating to future patrons who might come not only to buy staple goods, but also to eat food that Gloria would prepare. And for us, Gloria organized chairs and um, woven mats so that we could sit comfortably under the shade of a mango tree and have lunch to celebrate the opening of her new business. So I had first met Gloria at a clinic that I will call Clinica Deutsch, or um, Maputo City Health Center number two. Um, Clinica Deutsch is a small public health center. It's also home to a number of non-governmental projects um, funded by transnational organizations and UN agencies, including the Spanish Development Fund. Since the 1990s, funds from transnational projects have helped to support staff salaries, to provide food and medications for patients with HIV and TB, and to run a community health project in the nearby neighborhood. And these interventions have made important resources available to patients like Gloria who seek um, care at the clinic. So for instance, um, NGOs over the time that I've conducted research there, at various moments they've provided support to patients with AIDS, they've um, run programs for orphans and vulnerable children, often described by the acronym OVCs, um, they've provided um, interventions for patients with TB, and also projects targeting um, pregnant women, especially pregnant women at risk of malaria. At the same time, national health service projects run through the same clinic do things like provide maternal child health or antenatal care um, and provide basic and emergency medical services, as well as conducting referrals to Maputo's um, tertiary care centers. So this kind of public and non-governmental amalgam is common to both many clinics in Mozambique and to many global health programs. And it's an example of what scholars working elsewhere have described as the projectification of care, that is the ways in which even public forms of medical care and support come to be delivered either through or as projects. So kind of discrete and time-bound projects targeting um, vertical categories of disease or um, risk. So in Mozambique, these processes of projectification create important possibilities for access to medicine, but they've also coincided kind of temporally and in some ways structurally with an erosion of other forms of support and the growth of um, political and economic inequality. So as is true of many cities on and beyond the African continent, life for most Maputo residents is marked by uh, inadequate public infrastructure, increasing perceptions of insecurity, and rapidly growing uh, income inequality. In Mozambique, these qualities of urban life have become more pronounced as natural resource extraction, especially in natural gas and coal, has produced economic cycles of boom and bust, um, but is perceived to be generating wealth that does not necessarily circulate e um, evenly through the, through, the, through the national community. So today I want to think about how these kind of changing economies and changing urban spaces impact the ways in which people access medical care. And I want to suggest that thinking about how space and place shape medical services can yield important insights into the role in particular of social class and of gender in shaping health and well-being in Maputo. So specifically, I want to ask how do urban livelihoods and spaces shape how people seek, claim, and make use of medical resources? How do historical legacies of gendered movement and labor in the city shape the possibilities for livelihood and medicine that exist for families like Gloria's? And what does health look like if we start from a vantage point that's defined not by clinical interventions or not only by clinical interventions, but also by the city itself? And I think that answering these questions offers us some insights into the experiences of patients, um, which is what I'll focus on today, but also into the experiences of health workers, and I'd be happy to talk about that in the Q&A. 
So in particular, I think that such an approach, starting from the city rather than the clinic, when we think about health in Maputo, offers us um, a couple of kind of theoretical and empirical possibilities. So one, as I mentioned, is that rooting analyses of health in urban space um, helps us to see the ways in which access to services is deeply shaped by gender and social class. But I also think it offers some broader theoretical implications that are relevant to anthropologists of medicine and of global health, but perhaps are of interest um, to, to you as well, or um, perhaps we might have a conversation about to what extent the debates are similar or different in the different fields that we come from. So anthropologists have drawn on biosocial approaches to think about how things like social inequalities, like gender disparities um, and geographical inequities, such as between Maputo and other cities, produce and shape illness and suffering. And so I think of um, the work of people like Paul Farmer as kind of emblematic of this sort of biosocial approach. Incorporating attention to place and particularly incorporating uh, theories of the African city or of African cities into our accounts can I think nuance these analyses by highlighting the city and by extension the clinic as spaces that are not only shaped by exclusion as much work on the kind of biosocial um, dynamics of health have argued but also by aspiration and agency. In so doing, these approaches can push back against what is sometimes called anthropology's suffering slot. So the suffering slot draws on a term originally coined by Haitian anthropologist Michel Rolf Triot, who argued that anthropology as a discipline was really defined by something that he called the savage slot. So this was the discipline's kind of fascination with and constitution through an imagination of a kind of ethnologized or racialized other. Scholars building on this work have argued that since the kind of 1990s when he made this argument, anthropology has moved away from this, um, this particular imagination with the other, but has replaced the kind of native or exotic um, other with instead a concern with the suffering subject and a preoccupation with um, documenting modes of exclusion, suffering, um, and objection. So I wanna suggest that thinking about health in relation to the city rather than only in relation to the clinic or um, to biomedicine as a whole can, can kind of push back against that suffering slot a little bit by offering a framework for acknowledging the difficulties and challenges that our research participants face, um, but not letting those challenges and difficulties be the only salient features of our accounts um, or be the kind of defining features of their lives. So those are the contributions that I think this approach can make to anthropology. Um, I hope that it's also relevant to people working in adjacent fields, and in particular, global health scholarship has kind of taken up a concern with urban, um, the urban dynamics of health and the effects of kind of urban inequality on health. And here too, I think that ethnographic accounts of urban life and urban health can, um, has something to contribute. And so in particular, I think that a kind of granular ethnographic approach can highlight not just the ways in which um, urban forms in general impact health, but can help us to sort of disaggregate um, what that means. So when we think about the people who live in slums or the people who live in informal neighborhoods, we could start to think about processes of differentiation within or between people living in those neighborhoods or within or between um, different neighborhoods within a city. And I've enjoyed some of the conversations I've had this morning around these, um, these ways of thinking. So that's the kind of broader argument I wanna make. My talk is um, organized in the following way. I'll talk a little bit about global health anthropology in Mozambique. Um, I'll focus particularly on the ways in which thinking about health in Southern Africa, including in Maputo, um, has been large, th there's been a kind of large body of scholarship that is concerned with how people move through space, but that much of that scholarship has been concerned with um, migration, migration from Mozambique to South Africa or sort of regional migration and specifically with men's migration and ma male mobility um, within the region. And so this has been a long problematic in thinking about public health in su Southern Africa is like the sort of problem of male labor migrants. Um, I wanna suggest that we can think about women's mobility too as an important kind of health issue and health resource. So after laying out that frame, I'll present three ethnographic vignettes. The first two will be very brief. I'll talk a little bit about how male migrants and their families were kind of seen and understood and treated in the clinic. I'll present the story of Yvette, who's a young woman um, whose family moved to Maputo relatively recently from kind of rural peri-urban areas. Um, and then I'll get into the meat of the story, which is Gloria's experience um, coming from a family that has inhabited kind of informal neighborhoods in Maputo for a long time. And I wanna suggest that there are 
um, there are kind of privileges, despite her in many ways precarious existence, there were also privileges that she um, enjoyed relative to someone like Yvette because of her family's long experience in the city. So global health anthropology in Mozambique. So Mozambique was a um, Portuguese colony and became independent in 1975. And from the colonial period, and in fact even before, there's um, lots of evidence that the management of space um, has been a key mode of um, kind of both managing health risks and issues, but also controlling urban populations. Prior to independence, so through the early 1970s, health services were concentrated in urban areas um, and largely served colonial settler populations. Um, so health issues for rural and peri-urban populations were largely left to um, churches, to families, to kind of extra, um, extra state modes of social organization. Following independence, Mozambique adopted a Marxist-Leninist political platform and the creation of a fully uh, nationalized and fully free, um, free of economically, financially free um, public health system became a kind of cornerstone of the immediate post-independence regime. So by 1978, for instance, the WHO had recognized Mozambique's health system as a model of primary health care. And this was kind of in the era of Alma-Ata and kind of public health commitments to health for all. Despite this turn to kind of nationalization and um, the adoption of a public model of health, Mozambique's health system continued to associate um, the provision of biomedical services with a particular vision of political modernity. Um, so medicine was a tool of modernization and a tool for remaking um, rural or peri-urban populations. And medicine also remained concentrated in urban centers and especially kind of tertiary or specialty services remained concentrated in cities such as central Maputo rather than the fast expanding suburban and peri-urban areas of the city. Moreover, by the mid 1980s, the country was in the middle of a um, brutal and protracted war. By the late 80s and early 1990s, Mozambique had signed kind of international loan agreements with the IMF and the World Bank, adopted a um, set of kind of democratization but also economic, economic liberalization policies. And among those political economic shifts was the remaking of the public system around a kind of more fee-driven um, model of health. So sort of moving away from this fully nationalized vision of public health systems. Peace accords were signed in 1992 um, and this kind of era of democratized but also liberalized health services was kind of ushered in. And at the same time, Mozambique also experienced a kind of rapid influx of transnational organizations who came on the one hand to kind of fill in the gap of health services that had once been seen as the purview of the state, whether or not the state actually provided those services, and also were responding to what was um, increasingly being seen as the kind of emerging um, awareness of the HIV AIDS pandemic. So this kind of story is not unique to Mozambique, although some aspects, the kind of political conflict maybe are, are different, but um, in many ways the, stories of, the story of Mozambique's public health system um, speaks to kind of larger shifts in the way we think about and fund, um, fund health around the world. So this, shows the, this slide just shows the growth in um, funding for global health from the early 90s to the mid 2000s. Um, and you can see that during the first decade of this millennium, um, funding increased by more than 10% annually worldwide. So many countries um, experienced this kind of growth in global health funding. Uh, but Mozambique has also been one of the countries that has received um, a particularly large portion of those funds. So um, it's, the US government is one of the top funders of global health and um, Mozambique is a primary recipient. So although um, funding for global health has now kind of plateaued and some people have argued that it's declined, uh, donor funds continue to be really important to health services in Mozambique. So about 50% of the national health budget is funded by um, donor organizations and bilateral agencies. One of the critiques of this way of funding health has been that um, donor projects and NGO projects can lead to a kind of proliferation of parallel systems and the fragmentation of public health structures. And partly in response to these critiques, both the Mozambican national health system and many NGOs have sought to locate transnational projects in the public system, um, with the result that clinics like Clinica Deutsch, which are public clinics, um, are home to many uh, transnationally funded projects and agencies. 
So on the one hand, some have suggested that these efforts to embed transnational funds in public systems have not entirely succeeded in kind of reducing the fragmentation of the public system. For instance, they build kind of inequities in pay scales into the same clinic. So you have people who are being paid by the public system and are earning much less than their colleagues who are being paid by NGOs and things like this. Um, I want to also point to a different um, kind of challenge that this way of organizing health services has presented. Um, the, the public health system in Maputo was uh, built on the back of a colonial health system that was never designed to serve the population more broadly. And so by embedding transnational funds and NGO projects in the public system, the kind of spatial inequalities between the areas of the city that have ample access to health resources and newer areas of the city where there are many fewer resources actually becomes amplified by this very effort to kind of reinforce the public system. And so I want to think through the experience of patients who use the system, how these inequities kind of play out. And I should note that people have criticized um, the role of NGOs in kind of concentrating NGO resources in cities. Um, it's often easier to attract expatriate staff, for instance, to live and work in Maputo, which is a really um, lovely city if you can afford to live in the kind of old um, central parts of it. Um, it's much easier to attract staff to live there where there are schools and restaurants and so on than in a rural area. But I want to say that even within the city, these kinds of geographical inequities kind of persist. And they were really evident when I did things like travel with Gloria from her father's house to her new home or travel with her from her new home to the clinic. So I just want to show you what her kind of trajectories look like. So Maputo is built on a kind of bluff overlooking the Indian Ocean. This is the old um, city center, the colonial core, which is often called the cement city because it was the um, part of the city that was kind of built in the European model during the colonial period. This is Klinika Deutsch, which is um, outside the city center, but is still in the kind of old informal neighborhood, so relatively close to the city center. And most of the public transportation in the city um, is organized kind of flowing into the city center. So it's much easier to travel like this than it is to travel kind of horizontally across. So the clinic was re relatively close to the city center. It was also close to Gloria's father's house, which was here in the neighborhood of Mashakeni. Um, and it was served by a number of kind of shoppers and minibuses. But it was much farther from Gloria's new home, which was um, located over here. So the journey from Semse to the clinic required the same kind of journey that we had made on that afternoon that I described at the beginning of my talk. So multiple journeys in minibuses, um, in municipal buses, or in um, open back trucks called My Loves. So this is a shafa. It's a semi-privatized um, mode of transportation. I like this picture because it's a woman shopper driver, which is rare. Um, but so that's the primary mode of transportation. This picture is a little hard to see, but um, recently um, these kind of open back like pickup trucks have become an increasingly popular, well not popular, but necessary mode of transportation. And they're called my loves because when you go over a bump or you go around a corner, you have to like hold on to the person next to you so you don't fall out. And it's like, oh, my love. You hold on to each other. Um, so it's kind of a joke about the precarious nature of that transport. Um, so getting from her new house to the clinic was much harder than getting from her father's house to the clinic. Gloria was also only eligible to be seen at Clinica Deutsch, which was a desirable place to be seen precisely because it had these transnational projects and resources available. Um, she was only eligible to be seen there because she could claim her father's house um, as her uh, primary residence. And had she said that she actually lived here in Semse, they would have told her to be seen at Mashava General Hospital, which had many fewer resources and which she thought was a less desirable place to be seen. Um, so often when I talk about this project in Philadelphia, people draw an analogy to school catchment areas and the work that parents in Philadelphia do to be able to have an address in um, particular school zones, right? Um, so the ability to claim residents in diverse urban neighborhoods differentiated patients like Gloria from other patients who didn't have that kind of father's um, address or didn't have that ability to make um, lay claim to an address that was relatively um, close to the city center. At the same time, Gloria didn't want to live permanently in her father's house. There were many advantages despite the long distance from the center um, to living in Semse. So it offered her the chance to live in her own house. It offered her the chance to open her own business in the form of this baraka. She was also a primary school teacher, but she didn't earn very much money from that. Um, and it offered some land for farming, which she could further use to supplement her income and her diet. So 
It was observing these kinds of complex interrelationships between opportunities and challenges that emerged for Gloria as she moved through the city that I started to really wonder, like, how does movement through these diverse urban neighborhoods shape her possibilities for and ways of thinking about health, livelihood, and well-being? So that brings me to the second um, part of my talk, which is about gendered labor migration, because in fact, these questions about health, space, and livelihood are really old questions in the anthropology and public health literature on Southern Africa. Um, the way in which patients have moved through space and the impact of mobility on health have been central problematics for health interventions. And that's evident in this um, old HIV prevention billboard um, which shows a picture, this is a very archetypal, in some ways, image of the South Africa-Mozambique border. And it showed this trailer, this bus pulling a trailer, lo like really overloaded with stuff, is an image that's very common in certain types of year, when people who are working in South Africa and earning money in South Africa return to Mozambique bringing gifts, like so right before Christmas, for instance, um, would be bringing things that they are going to give to their family. And so one of the things that always strikes me about this image is not just this kind of image of like people are bringing um, material goods, but what else are they bringing back? There's like this language of like, stop, don't compromise the future of your family. This idea that the migrant, the returning migrant worker is also bringing health threats to the family, um, but also that all the people in this image are men. Um, so there's this kind of long historical association between migration and kind of masculine mobility and masculine labor. And there are historical reasons um, for this, which I won't belabor, I'm happy to talk about them longer, but during the colonial period, Portuguese tax policy really encouraged and in some ways made male migration outside of Mozambique imperative. So there were, um, it became both a kind of key way that families survived was through the salaries that men earned working abroad, but it was also a, a way that the Portuguese state accessed um, foreign currency reserves. And so there were real kind of intense historical pressures that generated these modes of labor migration. Um, but then and now male migration was also always seen as putting wives and families um, potentially at, at risk. And so the idea that men would travel uh, while families more appropriately remained fixed in space has a long history. And it continues in representations like this one. So this is a NPR story from a couple years ago about Mozambique, and it um, continues to kind of use this imagery of men as like mobile health risks, so male truck drivers, um, and women who in this case are not just kind of um, waiting at home, they're working, but they're still imagined as being kind of fixed in place and at risk from the diseases that men might be bringing with them. So in these representations, mobility is seen as dangerous, but the histories through which mobility has been encouraged as a way that people make a living um, tends not to be depicted. And both of these understandings of mobility as something that could put your health at risk, but that it was also a really integral way to the, that people um, earned a livelihood, shaped the way that care was delivered in the clinic. Um, so we can see this through thinking about how men and women received care in the clinic. So on the one hand, um, nurses would often um, acknowledge and in some cases accommodate men who, who described their work abroad or who were in some sense um, mobile subjects. So for instance, there was a um, man who was treated at Clinica Deutsch who was a retired mine worker. Um, mining labor was long a kind of key economic resource in Maputo. It is not, not so much anymore. Um, but so he had worked in South Africa for many years in the mines and had now returned. And the nurses in the clinic were really anxious that I interview him and were always telling me like he has a really important story. You should hear this story because it's very emblematic of something about life in Maputo and something, something about life in Mozambique is important for you to understand. And what was important for me to understand was that it captured these kinds of historically um, kind of salient dynamics of health and mobility. Um, they also sometimes assisted men who were working overseas. So one young man um, named Adilson, who was about 25 years old when I met him, told me that he actually worked in Cape Town, which is um, thousands of kilometers away. So he was Mozambican. He had grown up in rural Mapuche province. Then his family had moved to Mapuche City, and he had eventually gotten a job through a kind of, um, long story, but had gotten a job in a night, nightclub in Cape Town. But he returned every six months to the clinic 
to get his antiretroviral medication prescription refilled. And this was longer, you were supposed to come no, no, um, at least every three months, if not more frequently, but he kind of talked one of the doctors into extending his prescriptions to accommodate the fact that he was working so far away. Um, so I didn't meet many people who traveled such long distances, but his efforts to combine care on one side of the border with work on another side of the border um, seems to me indicative of the ways in which many, many men were able to kind of use health resources and to incorporate them into livelihood strategies. Um, it was much harder for women, however, to receive these kinds of accommodations. Um, not only were they often um, women who said that they, for instance, couldn't come to the clinic with their husband because he was working abroad or was working far away, were often accused of kind of fabricating this story. Um, women who themselves claimed to be working far the, outside the city were often similarly told either that they were, um, you know, they were accused of being untruthful or they were um, accused of being kind of irresponsible health subjects. So in the remaining por portion of my talk, I just want to talk about how that, those kinds of dynamics played out in the story of Yvette and Gloria. So Yvette, who I'll talk about very briefly, um, was the mother of a two-year-old. And when I first got to know her, she was um, living in Mashava, so further out even than Semsei. And, um, it's about 15 kilometers from Mashava to the clinic, but it can take um, a couple of hours, depending on the time of day and the mode of transportation, to make that journey, which is um, difficult for in any circumstances, and especially with a two-year-old. And in fact, sort of cranky and overtired children were a frequent feature of life in the clinic because parents um, face these really long um, and demanding journeys. So I was relieved when uh, Yvette told me that she was going to move from Mashava to a neighborhood very close to the clinic together with her husband who was working as a driver for um, a private family. So she thought that perhaps living closer to his work would kind of ease domestic tensions in their marriage that he had been feeling overworked and um, grouchy and that they, she was kind of trying to repair the relationship in part by making their life easier in the city. However, moving to this new central neighborhood meant that their rent was much, expen much more expensive. They lived in a much smaller space. Um, her husband continued to have problems at work, which was driving some of this conflict. And she really missed her parents, her friends, and the evangelical church community that she had had in this um, suburban neighborhood of Mashava. So for Yvette, it was not really clear that making this trade between um, Mashava and the, center, the city center was really paying off in terms of increased domestic stability and um, an increased ability to care for her son who was um, HIV positive. So in the meantime, she faced kind of financial difficulties and she relied on the kinds of NGO resources like food packets um, that NGOs at the clinic made available for parents um, who were struggling to care for young children. So I want to contrast her difficulties moving through the city with Gloria's experience um, to highlight the ways in which not just gender differences between male migrants and um, women um, impact, impacted their experiences of health, but also the ways that social class played out in medical spaces. So when I first met Gloria, um, I don't know if that's, um, when I first met Gloria, I was chatting with a clinic staff member and Gloria knocked on the door to say um, that she had agreed to return to the clinic with her mother-in-law, but that she was getting divorced and she no longer wanted to involve her mother-in-law in the care of her daughter. And could she bring someone else? Specifically, could she bring her brother's wife, her sister-in-law, Emma? And so the doctor said, yes, that's fine. You can come with whoever you want. You just need to bring one family member who's an adult and who is not the parent of the child. Um, the daughter was HIV positive and it was important that someone else in the family be trained in how to administer antiretroviral medications so that um, there could, to ensure continuity of care, to ensure that um, the little girl continue, would um, always have an adult who could provide her medications for her. So as I got to know Gloria, I realized that this kind of effort to move between family relations and different neighborhoods in the city um, were more complex than they first appeared when she, um, when she knocked on that clinic door. 
So Gloria was an educated professional, a primary school teacher, um, a savvy businesswoman. She also benefited from the financial and emotional support of her father, who lived in this neighborhood, Mashakeni, um, and of her brothers, including um, the brother whose family she wanted to involve in the care of Denise. This family support also facilitated her, not just her life in Mashakeni, but her move to Semse. So her father had um, supported her financially while after the kind of breakup of her marriage. Her brothers had helped to construct that baraka and um, house in the new, um, you know, the, in the new neighborhood. And um, both family and friends had provided kind of financial contributions towards buying the building materials. But these very forms of support, were, which were in fact the kinds of family relationships that cl the clinic tried to encourage, also came with specific expectations around how she should live her life and how she should care for her daughter. And sometimes these expectations were in conflict with medical, um, medical expectations and demands. So this became clear soon after that visit that I described at the beginning of the talk when Gloria finally moved permanently to live in Semse. So her baraka was up and running. She was actually earning quite a good um, income. She was one of the first people to open a business like this in this neighborhood. Um, once the school year started, she went back to teaching full time and hired someone else to continue running the business for her. Um, and she increased her profits by buying goods uh, in South Africa where they are cheaper and then reselling them in Maputo. So she also was making these kind of cross-border journeys much like Edilson um, and other men that I met in the clinic and many women in Maputo as well. But after about six months in Semse, Gloria fell ill um, with the first of what turned out to be a kind of series of health crises. And one of her neighbors in the new neighborhood took care of her, um, helped her kind of recover but her life in the neighborhood remained in, or, or became increasingly precarious. So because the neighborhood was unincorporated, it was not connected to municipal services. She had no running water and no electricity. And she relied on um, a well that was located on a neighbor's property in order to get water. So after a while, the neighbors, I think, observing the kind of success of her business, started charging more money for the use of the well. Gloria got in kind of an argument with the neighbors who she accused of being kind of lazy and greedy and overcharging her in a way that was unfair. Not long after this, um, Veronica intimated that the neighbors had been kind of gossiping about her and suggesting that she was involved in sex work. And Gloria, as this conflict escalated, um, decided to send her daughter, who is living with her in some say, back to her father's house in Mashakeni. And it was precisely this kind of arrangement that that clinic request to bring another caregiver was designed to um, kind of anticipate. So the fact that her sister-in-law had been trained in how to provide care for her daughter meant that the daughter could return to Mashakeni and that the sister-in-law, Emma, would provide, um, would administer her daily medications and that there would be continuity of treatment. And that happened. Um, so everything unfolded in some ways as it should have. But in practice, uh, living in this kind of, um, you know, extending family relations across the city became very stressful. So Gloria would send money to her father's house to kind of support the extra costs that her daughter would impose on the family. Then there would be fights about how that money was being spent or whether it was for all the children in the household or just for Emma, um, what was an appropriate, all, all the kinds of fights that people have about raising children, what, what counted as spoiling a child, what counted as um, just indulging a child and so forth. Um, So as her life kind of stretched across these multiple households in the city, Gloria's need to work creatively both with urban space and with the social relations in those different places um, became ever more kind of pressing. And this wasn't just true for Gloria. So it was also true for her sister-in-law who was now in charge of looking after her daughter. Um, Gloria's father had been very supportive. Um, it was his support that had allowed Gloria to move out of the house. But he also was committed to a kind of um, what might be glossed as traditional medicine or a traditional healing explanation of Gloria's illnesses. And so he insisted that both Gloria and her, her daughter should be treated not in the clinic, but by a traditional healer that he was going to bring from his home area um, in a rural district. And so um, both Gloria and her sister-in-law were kind of caught between the demands of the clinic to provide ARVs every day and the expectations of Gloria's father, which was that they should be using this other mode of medical treatment. 
These dynamics became even more um, kind of challenging as Gloria herself fell sicker. And so she eventually moved out of Semsei, entirely closed her business, and also returned to her father's house. Um, when she did, she began to seek care. She had a persistent cough, which she insisted was um, tuberculosis. And she decided to go not to Clinica Deutsch, but to another health center where she, um, where she had cousins who, who worked in the janitorial staff. And she was very insistent that she wanted to be seen at that health center by, by a specific doctor. And she eventually was seen um, by that doctor and she received a prescription for TB medication, a diagnosis of TB and, and received medication for it. So a TB diagnosis was significant for Gloria in two ways. One, um, she was treated for TB and she eventually recovered. She also was being treated by the traditional healer that her father had brought from, from um, this rural area. But she also, as a school teacher, got six months of paid leave um, from work with a TB diagnosis. And so this gave her time to recover, but it also gave her time, um, once she had recovered, recuperated some physical strength, to kind of restart her business. Um, so she was no longer running the Baraka in Semsei, but she once again, and now together with a sister, began traveling to South Africa to buy um, staple goods, this time not food, but things like um, accessories or clothing, things that she could kind of sell to friends and out of her house. Um, and so again, began kind of building up a small business in this way, using the time that she had off of work to do so. So this helped me to see that the treatments she received in the clinic helped Gloria's kind of livelihood efforts or helped her, her ability to live in the city, both in medical ways through ARVs or TB medications, but also in extra medical ways, like giving her the time that she needed to run her business um, and allowing her to move in between different kinds of health systems that responded to different biomedical and um, non-biomedical demands. Yet on the few occasions that I saw Gloria try to get accommodations for these strategies from health workers, she was most often rebuffed. So where Adilson had been accommodated with these like extended um, prescriptions, Gloria received comments like, um, you know, stop running around so much, which could be a comment about physical mobility, but could also be a kind of uh, um, suggestion that maybe she was being promiscuous or um, morally um, kind of incorrect. And one nurse said to her, you have to ask yourself, do I care about money or do I care about my health? And I thought this comment was so disingenuous, although I have a lot of sympathy for the nurses in this clinic, because the financial realities of care, including the need often to um, access care through small gifts to health staff or um, kind of petty bribery, um, was well known to everybody in the clinic. Um, but even beyond those kinds of real financial, like immediate financial transactions, um, it was clear to everyone in the clinic that financial well-being and health were deeply um, and inextricably kind of connected. So scholars of global health have shown how um, even small financial constraints can impede care. So for instance, if you can't afford the cost of public transportation to arrive at the clinic to get the, the treatment that you need, um, or if conditions of financial precariousness lead you to high-risk occupations. And this has been a kind of key insight of biosocial approaches to health. But I think that thinking about these dynamics, not just in terms of health, but also in the city, can help us to nuance um, our understanding of those connections between health and financial well-being. So Gloria was in difficult circumstances, but she wasn't destitute. It was never a question of, can she afford the, um, you know, the, the money to get to the clinic, the bus fare to get to the clinic. Rather, she had these broader aspirations of like living in her own home, starting her own business. She talked about um, getting a higher level teaching qualification. She taught first grade. If she could teach middle school, she would get paid somewhat more. Um, she aspired to enroll her daughter in private school in a context of public education that is um, direly underfunded. So thinking about the city, I think, can help us to take these aspirations seriously, um, not only to see her as um, preoccupied with daily survival. Um, this kind of emphasis on survival alone also misses the ways in which Gloria, despite all these challenges, was really in a privileged position compared to someone like Yvette. At the same time, Gloria was in difficult circumstances, and she wasn't only concerned with her own self-interest. She was also trying to be a good mother, to be a good daughter and respond to her father's expectations, um, to be a good sister or sister-in-law to her other family members. So to tease apart the ways in which these complex economic and social relations, sorry, this is um, just an example of other barakas in the city, what they might look like. 
um, to tease apart the complex relationships between financial well-being, urban space, and health, uh, I think that accounts of life in African cities can be helpful. So writing about the city of Kinshasa, urban theorist Abdul Malik Simone notes that it is not easy to define a supportable ethical or political position that takes into consideration the way in which precariousness and possibility can be thoroughly entangled. Um, so I think this perspective helps to capture the kind of twinning of precariousness and possibility in Gloria's experiences. So as she moved between different neighborhoods in the city, between different livelihood strategies, between different kinds of familial obligations, she also felt, faced different kinds of medical possibilities and medical outcomes. And so in this context, attention to strategies of urban living can I think show how possibilities in one domain, like the medical treatments that she received or didn't receive, also impact possibilities and opportunities in other domains, such as where she would live or what kind of business she would run. So my aim in this talk has been to show that situating access to medicine in light of both urban space and social relations highlights how, um, how medical care is always inflected by gender as well as by material infrastructures, non-governmental practices, public protections, and market opportunities. Um, and I think I want to conclude by just suggesting that a, ten, a kind of granular ethnographic attention, even to one person's experience, can help us to think about the connections between these very different domains in ways that might also illuminate broader kind of systemic um, processes that shape health in cities like Maputo and perhaps in cities elsewhere. Thank you very much for your attention. So we have about 12 minutes for some Q&A. Yeah, so um, yes, actually most of my work has focused more on providers um, and especially on like nurses and um, technicos de medicina, which would be sort of like physician's assistants, um, so sort of mid-level health staff. And I think one of the uh, challenges that I continue to kind of grapple with in thinking about their responses to observations like this. So I would say, like, don't you think that, um, you know, yes, yes, maybe Gloria is running around and yes, she might be behaving in ways that um, don't always conform with clinic norms. So for instance, um, many providers would um, completely prohibit the use of traditional medicines um, or the kind of clinic policy was to prohibit use of traditional medicines, even as it was like widely acknowledged that many people, probably most people, were also using them or used them at some points. Um, and what I found was that health staff were, on the one hand, cognizant of these kinds of gender differences in the ways that they responded to patients. Um, on the other hand, saw these kinds of behaviors as deeply moral and with deep implications for health. So somebody who would say you should stop running around would say like, yes, maybe I'm, maybe I should say that to men too, but men won't listen to me and women will. Or we know women are more vulnerable. And so that's, that's why I'm getting so angry. Or I just think that behavior is morally wrong. And I think it, for me, it's hard to, to separate out the kind of moral judgment, which I think actually the care would probably be more effective without it, or at least I didn't see evidence that people were changing their behavior in response to it, um, with the fact that these health workers were also deeply invested, in some cases, in their patients. And so um, how to balance that kind of moral judgment with the fact that sometimes it was actually a reflection of their investment in patients is something I, I struggle with. Thank you for the question. things that's really interesting about this work is it, it brings both, you know, kind of residential mobility mm -hmm. to new locations that are your home base and mobility 
for work for these trips kind of together. So mm-hmm. the the transportation infrastructure for those longer trips. I mean, mm-hmm. you kind of told us about within the city. But yeah. Can you talk about uh, what was available, what was constraining about those longer distance? Trips? Yeah. So that's a great question. I've never thought about the placing those two journeys together through through the lens of like public transport. But shoppas, which are those minibuses, are um, a key mode of transport for almost every kind of travel. And so some people would take buses to South Africa. Um, and there are both kind of like Greyhound style buses that are more expensive and also um, more affordable, less comfortable buses. Um, and so the billboard showed like one of those kind of less comfortable buses. But people often also take shop us to South Africa. And so women, the kind of strategy that Gloria had of going to South Africa and buying stuff and bringing it back to sell in Maputo is a really common, um, I mean, people go to South Africa to buy stuff to consume for themselves, and they also go to buy stuff to sell to other people because it's cheaper to buy in South Africa. And so women, especially who are doing this kind of cross-border trading, will often take shoppas sometimes to South Africa, sometimes to the border, and then walk across the border and then take another one. But because it's not a terribly long journey, it's, a couple, it's like 45 minutes really to the border. Um, the way that people most often do it is to go one day, stay overnight, buy all the stuff and come back the next day. And so um, there's also, there's the kind of logistical challenge of organizing transportation. There's also the sense of security risks, especially for women of traveling late at night or potentially staying overnight um, or going early in the morning. And so. Um, Gloria, when she went, would often go with a sister or a friend um, and many other women I know in Mapuche who do it, sort of organize themselves into groups so that they can go more safely. So there's the kind of combination of the the material aspects of the transport, but then also what that like slightly precarious mode of transportation, if you're changing shoppas near the border late at night, that feels unsafe. And so then needing also these kinds of relationships of people who will go with you. And Gloria would say sometimes like, I don't really wanna go, but my sister wants to go. So I'm just gonna make the trip because she can't go on her own and she needs the money. Um, so it also called into being these different kinds of relationships around travel. Um, so yeah, and, and and really different gendered expectations because I've never talked, I've never heard men say I'm, for, although they also face security risks, but that kind of ex- overt concern with like traveling together to manage their own security um, was much more something I heard from women. So thank you for the question. Uh huh. So I guess um, my question's around how do you see these stories of kind of people moving through the city of Maputo and, and that shaping their care? kind of feeding back into an idea of a dynamic city on a more structural level. Because I think Mm -hmm. it's like Lori is moving through all these places, but how does this kind of, and I don't know if if you know, but how does this accumulate into maybe a narrative around how does Mutuputu become more dynamic? And kind of going back to like, transit seems very fixed and going in, instead of across. And and I guess I'm just wondering about it, also kind of in relation to the colonial past, and like how do you break, the very physical, like th- those were created in yeah. a very um, like political sense, and, and is there an element of overcoming that in order to integrate these stories of actual people into making the city dynamic? Yeah, that's a great question. For so, for <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. So I think that there is um, Maputo is a dynamic city, and there's a lot of these. It's expanding quickly, right. and. So the kinds of like new neighborhoods that Gloria was moving into, um, one of the things that I find so interesting about them is that it's both like young people who can't afford to buy. So like Gloria could never afford to live where her dad lives. There's no space. And if you could buy space there, it would be expensive. Um, So there's people like moving out of the city. And then there's also people moving from the rural areas into the, so it becomes a foothold for like these people who are on quite different trajectories and I think that's part of why I wanted to say like let's disaggregate even the neighborhood because people are moving into that neighborhood and then moving out of it in really different ways. Um, So there's a lot of sort of dynamism in these places that's not it's it's like the connection then back to that municipal service or that idea of the health system that is still um, really concentrated in a particular idea of where the city is Um, and it's not just municipal services, it's also like banks and banking infrastructure. And um, so all these kinds of services that are um, 
on the one hand, building on this colonial architecture, as you say, and then on the other hand, in the context of like some people becoming fabulously wealthy and um, a kind of growing like expatriate community and elite community, all of which is concentrated in the old part of Maputo, some say and people like Gloria are not necessarily the most desirable consumers. So it's also like the municipal, the public infrastructure is kind of has this historical legacy and then the new privatized infrastructures aren't always aimed at young like not exactly marginal but also not wealthy people because that's not where like the profit is to be made but then there are all sorts of other interesting social spaces and like the fact that the church was so important for Gloria and her neighbors um, there's other kinds of, like social spaces that are really proliferating um, in those neighborhoods so those could also be points of connection and harnessing between these systems. It's like it might require us thinking more openly about what we think about when we think about infrastructure. And are there, I mean, is there a move to make those spaces more, also more health oriented as well? And, and I guess I'm wondering, is there a way for them to serve as a, as a point where, right, like women can start yeah. to access the, the flexibility of the healthcare system is it outside of these like very, like the clinics that yeah. very structured gendered identity ideas of yeah. women's health should be in, in. That's a good question. So there are, there's increasingly mobile clinics that will go like, especially in rural areas, but also sometimes in peri-urban areas and like be there one day a week. Um, there's also a turn to like using cell phones and sort of mobile technologies to deliver health information. But then it's that point of like, when you have the food basket that you want to deliver or the, um, yeah, it's interesting, like there's long been mobile vaccination teams, but there are not mobile ARV, um, per, you know, refilling efforts to refill prescriptions. And I don't know, actually, there's, it would be interesting to follow like what, what historically has been delivered in a mobile way and then what is seen as requiring this kind of systemic right. dimension. So thanks for that good question. Did you have your hand up? about, you know, the business folks you know, who are might be more migrating within the city or coming in and, you know, dealing with transportation issues. I mean, is there a big interest to like, obtain their own motor vehicle, I guess? Is that part of the process of their, you know, urban and how they're yes. part of the urban area? And how does that, I mean, you know, if there's not the public transit needs, like, how, how does that fit into their, and how, how rapid is that happening? Yeah, it's happening really rapidly. So yes, the desire to then own your own car or motorbike um, is like one common way of dealing with the inadequacy of public transit. Um, and then it kind of actually exacerbates the problem because now there's terrible traffic jams and so it takes even longer. Um, so talking about traffic in Maputo is like everybody's favorite pastime. And there's also a proliferation of different kinds of transportation. So the My Loves, which had been banned in the, um, by the socialist government that traveling in these kind of open vehicles was seen as like not modern and not desirable and also a um, safety risk, they have now come back in. And the use of kind of um, like tuk-tuks or um, I don't know what you call that category, but like uh, -taxi. moto taxi things, yeah, have also um, flourished and yeah. So both, both a proliferation of private transport and other modes of transportation. This has really been a great way to help imagine how how things are actually playing out in a place that's unfamiliar to us, but also see some of the human dimensions that mm -hmm. then link to work we're doing here and work we're doing in Latin America. So thank you very much yeah. for spending time with us. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention. I really enjoyed it.